I'm Joe Shapiro. I direct the Center for Professionalism and Peer Support at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. I'm also the Division Chief for Otolaryngology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. You're going to watch two scenarios, each of which centers around a clinical error, and each of which then shows a disclosure conversation with the patient's family. I'd like you to pay attention to what you think has gone well in each scenario and what you think could have gone better. And then we'll have a discussion highlighting some of those points. Hello, my name is Dr. Posner. This is Dr. Evans. Hi, sir. Hello. How are you feeling? Well, I'm pretty groggy, and uh, uh, the medicines helped somewhat, but the, the pain is, uh, is still pretty significant. Um, I wonder what happened during the surgery, and where are my children? You know, why don't we do this? Why don't we go speak to your children? and we'll be back to see you shortly. Is that okay with you? Okay. We're gonna go see your children. We'll be back shortly, okay? Okay. Great. Let's go. Be sure to use your call bell, okay? Okay, we're gonna go talk to the family. As I see it, this is what we'll do. We'll tell them what happened. You started it, you did three, two, three sticks, I took over, I did two sticks. Who the heck knows who did the, who caused the pneumothorax? You know, if you haven't caused the pneumothorax, you probably haven't done enough central lines. I know, I know, it just feels like bad luck. You know, I don't think I'm gonna have much to say. What if they ask me a question? I would defer to me, okay? Let me do all the talking. If you do say something, I do not want you to say I'm sorry. You shouldn't have to say I'm sorry. Okay, and I'm here all night, so, you know, they can always ask me something. After Good, this. that's great, tell them that. But I hope that they don't get so upset that they're going to bother you all night. I know. Okay? Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Hello. Hi. My name's Hi. Dr. Posner. This is Dr. Evans. This is our nurse, Sam. Hi. Hi, I'm John. It's my sister, Karen. Is it okay if we talk to you about your dad? Yeah, yeah. please. We've been waiting. You know, as, as, as you probably know, he was pretty sick. He had what's called septic shock. He came in with an infection and his blood pressure was low and he was pretty, pretty, pretty sick. We had to give him IV fluids. We gave him some vancomycin and cefepime. You know, he is somewhat better, but we, there was a complication. What kind of complication? What, yeah, happened? what happened? Well, he had what's called a pneumothorax. What happened was we needed to start an intravenous line. We were unable to get a line into his arm, so we had to resort to doing what's called a central line. Sometimes we have to use the line in his neck, a vein in his neck, and we have to put a needle in so we can get this line in. Sometimes when we do that, it causes a new, what's called a pneumothorax. We clip the top of his lung, it deflates, and it causes his blood pressure to go down, and he became a bit short of breath. He had a central line last time he was here. What happened? Who did the procedure? So I started the procedure. You, you did the procedure? Well, I started the procedure. Aren't you the intern? Yeah, you know, I've done this before, and it's gone fine. How many times have you done this? I've done it a few times. Did you help him? Isn't he attending? All right, let's, let's, let's wait a minute. He did the procedure. I was there the entire time the procedure was being done. I was there to supervise him. It went exactly the way it should have gone. We actually, had, we actually used something called ultrasound to try to decrease the chances of this happening. 
even with the ultrasound, this can be a complication. Is this something that happens a lot? It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So will it affect his recovery? I don't think in the long run. He had to, he had to put a chest tube in, and the chest tube might make his stay longer. Did you put that in too? No, sir, I did not put it in. We got a specialist to put it in. We got a thoracic surgeon. He did it. Your dad's doing better now. Is he in a lot of pain? He did have some pain, but he's doing a lot better now, and he's actually asking to see you both. We want to see yeah, him. Yeah, I would like to see him. Okay, I've got another patient to see. Have I answered all your questions for now? Uh, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, will ha I, I have to go, but I will promise I'll see you later. Okay, I've got to go. So I'm here all night. Uh, if you need something, maybe you could just get the nurse to page me, um, but I'm going to take off as well, okay? Yeah, I'm still a little bit confused about all this. I know, it's very confusing. Um, his pain is under more control and he's awake and he's actually asking to see you, so why don't we go in to see him and we, I'll explain everything to both you and to him. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So now you've just watched a video that showed a scenario of the the error and the discussion with the patient's family afterwards. What I'd like to do is try to highlight some of the specific behaviors that you think were effective and then those that you think were less effective. On the plus side, the fact that they did have the conversation at all has to be called out as a positive. That's important. They did do it and we have to acknowledge that. Some of the other positives were that they did bring the team, some other team members in, and I think that was a uh, probably a good decision, probably helpful for the family. So they marked that time as important. So now I think we should focus on the challenging behaviors that occurred, things that we think could have been handled better. To start with, they we're actually discussing the event in front of the patient and I think that's not fair. They really needed to have that discussion in private. When they came into the room, we talked about the importance of sitting down, being at eye level for many reasons and they did not do that and I think that would have been a huge help if they had. In describing what happened, they used a bit too much jargon. I don't think it was particularly clear to the family. And although they asked for questions, it was clear by their posture and their tone and the, the rhythm of that opportunity that they really weren't welcoming questions. So they really didn't pause when they said, do you have any questions? There really wasn't a pause enough for the family to be able to actually ask the questions. And it speaks to the importance of explicitly asking for questions, but then allowing space and time for that to happen. They never really did express empathy. There was no clear, I'm sorry this happened, or we, this isn't what we wanted to see, and I'm sure not what you wanted to see, anything that says that we're sorry from an empathic standpoint. And that, that's a big problem. I think that's a huge gap. At the end of the discussion, they rushed out, and that was evidenced by their literally backing out and also saying we are busy, we have to see other patients. I think it's important when you're having a difficult discussion like this to make it a very unrushed, even if your day is rushed, you need coverage, people can help you offload other things you have to do. You have to be very present for the family and the patient. and. That includes not getting paged and not leaving before you've opened it up for patients to express their emotions if they choose and to ask questions. Okay, let's go speak to the family, okay? Hey Sam, you wanna go, we're gonna go speak to the family, why don't you come on? Okay, we're gonna go talk to the family. And the way I think we should do it is, I'll take the lead. We'll tell them what happened. We have nothing to hide here. You started the procedure, you did two attempts. 
I went and finished the procedure. I did my two attempts. We got the line. Unfortunately, it caused a pneumothorax, a totally regrettable mistake. The biggest thing is we need to apologize to them. We have to, we have to apologize. It was a bad outcome, but it was really important that we do that. I totally agree. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm still a little bit nervous. I haven't done this before. What if they ask me a question or something? You know, I've, I've been there. It's, it, this is a very difficult situation. If they ask you a question, just be honest with them. It, what happened, happened. It's part of the process of taking care of a patient. I would just be really, you know, sympathetic to them. That makes sense. And also, I'm here all night, so I can just touch base with them if they have any questions. Okay, that, that's fantastic. I would tell them that. We understand, though, that they can be upset about this. And, it, you know, our job is to support them through this. Mm -hmm. totally. Anything else do you think we should say? Um, no, I think you're right. They seem exhausted, so we, I wouldn't be surprised if they were a little bit upset. And I'm actually here all night as well. Perfect. So we can work together. Exactly. Okay, you ready to go? Let's go. Let's go. Hi, I'm Dr. Paz. I'm John. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. This is our nurse Sam, and this hey. is Dr. Hey. Evans. Hey. Do you mind if we have a seat and talk to you about yeah, your dad? Yeah, sure. We, we want to hear. We've been right. waiting. So as you probably know, your dad was fairly sick when he got here. He was in what, what's called septic shock. And what that is is a bad infection that gets into the bloodstream. Your blood pressure goes down, and you, you get pretty sick. We had to give him IV fluids to get his blood pressure up, and we also needed to give him antibiotics. He got the antibiotics, and he act he's actually doing a bit better now. So he's better? He's, he's better, but I did want to tell you that there was a complication in our caring for him. What kind complication? of complication? Unfortunately, we had, to, we had to put in a central line, and when you put in a central line, you ultimately can nick the top of the lung. We had a hard time getting the IV into his arm, so we had to resort to putting a, a, a IV into his neck. Sometimes when we do that, we can nick the top of the lung. The lung can deflate and ultimately cause him to be short of breath, his blood pressure to drop. We recognized it immediately, and we actually took care of him. But he had a central line last time he was here. How did this happen, and who did this? Yeah, so it was actually me that started the procedure. You, you did the procedure? Yeah. Aren't well, you the intern? I am the intern. You know, I've done it several times before, and it's gone totally fine. Didn't you help him? What we do at, at, in these situations is he does the procedure while I supervise him. We use an ultrasound to try to minimize the risk of this, but even with the ultrasound, these things sometimes happen. I am, we are terribly sorry. Is it something that happens a lot? It doesn't happen a lot, but even with the ultrasound, it can happen. Will it affect his recovery? I don't think it will affect his recovery ultimately, but we did have to put what's called a chest tube in to reinflate his lung, and that might cause him to have to stay in the hospital a couple of extra days. Did you do that too? Oh, no, no, sir. I didn't do that. Did once, you do it? No. Once, once we recognized that this was a problem, we immediately called the thoracic surgeon. They have the specialists that do this. He came immediately. He put the chest tube in. Your dad's lung reinflated, and he's doing much better now. Is he in a lot of pain? He was, but he's doing better, and he's resting comfortably. He's a little sleepy, but he would like to see both of you. Yeah, we'd like to. Yeah, we want to see him. I think that's a good idea. Now, I'm going to be here the rest of the night. If there's any questions, please do not hesitate to page me. Again, we're sorry this happened, but your dad's doing much better now. I'm actually going to be here all night as well, so why don't we do this? After you see your dad, we'll touch base, see if you have any more questions, okay? Great. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So now you've watched the second video where the error was the same, but the disclosure conversation was held in a different way. And I want to highlight really the changes that were made from the first to the second, which I think were all improvements. The first was that that initial discussion about what happened was not done in front of the patient. Very important. The next is, as they went in to see the patient's family, they went in and they actually sat down. They were more clear about what happened. There wasn't any jargon. They explicitly welcomed questions and then they actually, by their posture and their leaving time and silence, they let that happen. They let the questions be asked. 
when they were finishing up the conversation, which of course at some point you do have to leave the room, they did it in a way that didn't feel rushed, at least to the those of us observing the scenario. They gave time for, as I said, questions, for emotional expression, and then they concluded, and then they left. I think another improvement in the second scenario is that they actually opened this up to the other two team members who were there, not putting them on the spot, but inviting them into the conversation if they had anything to add. Keeping in mind that disclosure is a process, not an event, they explicitly said, after you've seen your family member, if you'd like to ask any other questions, please let us know and we're gonna, we can meet again. I think that's really important to offer that explicitly. One of the most important things to do in preparing to have a disclosure conversation, discussion with a patient is to get, just get a, a personal handle on our emotions so that we don't walk in the room with those emotions and, the, and distract from our most important mission at that moment, which is to be there for the patient. And I use the example of the book the house of God where he talks about before you go into the room where the patient is coding is to take your own pulse and I think taking your own emotional pulse when you're about to walk into the room with a patient is really important. We are taught to be healers as we should be but there's not a lot of training on uh, human factors which if there were I think people would understand that we are human and we are going to make errors. And that our job as a healthcare system and as individual healthcare providers is to anticipate the errors, try to minimize their occurrence, but anticipate that they will happen, and then try to devise a system, design the system, so that those errors don't reach the patient. That said, there is a natural human fallibility that we really don't buy into culturally and that's something that I think would be helpful if we can change in our education and training is acknowledging the humanity in each of us. So with that, there's still this sense that when something goes wrong and if we've made a mistake that we've really let our patient down, the family down, and our profession down. So that's a sort of, that is a sense of shame, which is very powerful negative emotion. And there's, there's a researcher, Helmreich, who looked at the similarities between enculturation and aviation and that of medicine, and he observed that both have engendered a sense of personal invulner invulnerability and the sense of perfection, which is impossible to achieve. It's a wonderful goal, but I think that we are going to fall short of it because we're human. So there's a moment after something goes wrong where I think most clinicians feel deeply sad and ashamed about what's happened. And what the emotions that we'll talk about are not things that I would tell anybody they shouldn't feel. I think it's most important to acknowledge if you do feel them. Because if you don't acknowledge that you're feeling them, they can actually get in the way and negatively impact your ability to show up in a, in a transparent and compassionate way for, to the patient. So there's also on the heels of the shame and the sadness, I think there's a feeling many times of fear. What's, this going, what's going to happen to the patient? What's going to happen to me uh, as a clinician? Will this result in a loss of reputation? Do I feel incompetent? Should I be doing these procedures or taking care of such sick patients? And a lot of questioning around our own capabilities. And I think there's a tremendous sense of isolation, even though intellectually we know that our colleagues have made errors and that we're going to make them because we're human, even if we have accepted that intellectually, I think it's pretty hard to accept it in reality. And I think we start to feel very alone. And part of the aloneness is exacerbated by 
our colleagues' reaction at times, which can be distancing ourselves from each other and also judging each other when things have gone wrong. I think all of this is changing, meaning I think that we as colleagues are working on understanding that isolating each other when this happens is probably the worst thing you can do. And so we have programs to try to obviate that natural human tendency to try to distance ourselves from each other when something bad happens in medicine. There's a particular emotion that I think everybody should bring in the room that every colleague I know has felt at these times, and that is incredible empathy for the patient and family. And so that, I would say, is, should be the leading emotion. And that expression of empathy should come very naturally to people if they can access it, because it's there. It just needs to come out. I think the other important is to important parameter is to set up the meeting so that it's private, um, that you're not distracted, that your beeper is off, um, and that people understand you're entering this room in this moment, and you need to be totally focused. And I think that's key. Also, if it's appropriate, is thinking about are there other people who can come in the room with you? Could be anyone in the healthcare team with whom that patient or family has developed a relationship. Sometimes it might be one of the nurses or social workers, uh, one of the trainees. It doesn't matter. It's just somebody who could be there partly, again, for the patient and family, um, but it's not necessary. It's just something to think about. So as one would enter the room, I think the most important thing to do is to be, um, well, to sit down and be at the eye level to the patient. Sounds obvious, but I think part of us doesn't want to be seated and wants to be halfway out the door, even though we do want to. We need to, we really need to be very physically and mentally and emotionally present. So being seated, looking the patient and the family in the eye and saying, I have something to discuss with you about what happened today or yesterday or what have you. And then being very clear about the facts as to what happened. The challenge is to be, first of all, to translate the facts into non-jargon. I think unconsciously there's part of us that does not want the patient to really understand what happened, and I think that leads can lead to some obfuscation and jargon or rushing through an explanation where we say, well, we've said something, we've told them, but they really, patient and family really haven't understood. And the social workers with whom I've worked and other healthcare team members have the experience of patients turning to them or asking them later on in the day, I don't understand what happened to me, even though the physician maybe has said what happened, it wasn't in a way that was understandable to a patient. So being using very clear language and very specifically, here's what happened. One of the principles in disclosure is that it's a process, not an event. So you may only have part of the information as to what happened or specifically as to why something happened. And it's very important both for you and also for the patient not to throw out a bunch of possible explanations. And I'll tell you, I think we have a lot of trouble holding to that premise. And the reason I believe that's true, that it's hard for us not to speculate, is we're so used to giving a differential diagnosis 
So we're always speculating with patients. I think you have A, and we're gonna treat it with these medications or this procedure, but it's possible that actually it's going to turn out to be B or C, and we'll wait and see, and we'll come back to those possibilities if that's what emerges. And that's quite appropriate when you're doing a treatment plan with a patient is to speculate. But it isn't really at all appropriate in this setting. It can lead to a lot of confusion and also a lot of self-incrimination that could be completely unnecessary and destructive to your relationship to the patient. When you go back and say, what I told you I thought might have happened was wrong. And I think we have to be very mindful of building a trustful relationship with the patient. We've already had a trustful relationship, presumably. An error can really erode that trust, and you have to be mindful of trying to recreate that sense of trust to the extent that you can do so by being trustworthy. And that includes just being clear about what you know. It also puts us in a position of, at times, not being able to answer questions. So a patient, you may tell a patient what you know, and then the patient or family might have a lot of questions about, well, why? Or who did that? Or how could that happen? And you may be in the position, I think very frequently, we're in that position of saying, that's a very important question. I don't know the answer to that yet. We're going to look into it and I will get back to you or someone from my team will get back to you when we do have that answer, those answers. And then just sit with that uncertainty, which is very uncomfortable. As I think it's a natural tendency to want to get out of the moment and the room as soon as possible. On the other hand, it's really important to have that commitment of sitting with the patient and family and leaving room for silence, for them to think, to express their emotions if they choose to, and also to ask questions. And I think it's so easy to say to do that, but to actually do it, it's very challenging because a lot of us in that moment, we don't really don't want to hear their reaction. And a corollary to that is that sometimes their reactions aren't what we hope for. I think there's a fantasy to some degree that, or a hope, a wish, that the patient will say to us, it's okay, I understand, Doc, you really are always trying to do your best and these things happen. We want to be forgiven by the patient, but that's not the patient's job. The patient's job is not to forgive us. If the patient does or the family does, it's a gift and it should be welcomed and appreciated. But to go in with that kind of neediness is really, I think, an unfair burden on the patient and family. We are obligated, I think, as a medical community to help each other forgive ourselves and forgive each other, but I don't think we should put that burden on the patient. And I think the, that importance of asking for questions, not just waiting for them, uh, is, it, it can't really be understated how important that is. If you just wait for questions, the patient may not ask them. And I think we, we will do better if we specifically say, do you have any questions? Is there anything that I didn't discuss that would be helpful to hear now? It's quite possible they'll have questions that you can't answer, but that's okay too. But I really think from what we understand that patients want the room to ask questions and they can feel very intimidated in that moment. So I think explicitly welcoming questions is very important. And it also gives the patient an opportunity to process what he or she is feeling. And again, I think that it's really important to remember that you can't control someone else's reaction. You can only control how you present, how you show up. How they react, that's up to them. And just understanding that you can do a beautiful job at have an amazing disclosure conversation from your point of view, and it may not be well received, and that's 
that happens, but that part is not under our control. it's most important to express empathy. So one of the most common ways that we do express empathy is to say, I'm sorry. And I recognize that that's a loaded word because in certain contexts saying you're sorry is an expression of empathy. And in other contexts, it's an expression of apology and acceptance of blame. And what I would say to that is, it, I understand it's contextual. I think you have to use the word that you're most comfortable with. And I think for most of us, to express empathy, sorry is a wonderful wor word. And how do you do that? I think, again, it, it's all in context, but phrases such as, I'm so sorry this happened. Uh, I, I know we talked about that it might happen, but it's not what any of us wanted, and I'm, I'm just so sorry that it did. I'm not saying, I am so sorry. I made a mistake. I'm not saying I'm so sorry that I'm a bad surgeon. I'm saying I'm sorry this happened and I truly am expressing empathy. There are going to be other situations where it's absolutely appropriate to say you're sorry as an apology that is accepting either personal or institutional or team blame for something. And if you're at a point in the patient's care where you're sure that there was an error, that there is something to apologize for, then absolutely that needs to be said. I'm sorry we made this mistake. I'm sorry we gave you the wrong dose of this medication. I'm sorry that happened. And just again, pause. And I think beyond that expression of empathy and perhaps of apology, depending on the context, explaining to patients at, towards the end of this discussion that it's important for us as an institution to learn from what happened, that we do understand it won't help the patient directly, but that we are going to try to learn from what happened and to understand how, knowing what we know now, we can do a better job next time. And why that's helpful, I think, is that even though it doesn't give any direct benefit to the patient and family, I think patients appreciate knowing that something didn't go wrong in vain. That is, that though the knowledge that we'll gain from what happened won't help them directly, I think people feel good about making sense of something that went wrong and making sense of it could be turning this into something that makes us a better healthcare institution, better team, better individual practitioner. And so I think it's important to address that if it's relevant. Most times it is. I think most times we can say realistically to patients, we are really going to learn from this and we'll tell you what we've learned. As far as understanding and learning from our disclosures, are we doing a good job? I think it is hard to know because the, per the people who could give us the feedback on that, the most relevant would be the patient and family. I think it would be very reasonable when you do follow up with the patient and family to say, how do you feel we've supported you? through this process? Is there anything we could have done different or we can do different? And it's a very good question to ask and get that actual feedback from the patient and family. But again, with the eye that it's really not about us. Um, so I think this is, it's hard to actually get feedback without asking for it. I think if it's appropriate and the residents in the room with the attending and is part, very much part of the disclosure conversation, I think that the attending, of course, should give feedback to the resident and hopefully vice versa outside of the patient's room as to what they think went well during the conversation and what they think could have done better. And I would say I would look at it, that moment or those conversations just like I would after debriefing a surgical case where we say, what do we think went well? What would we like to do better next time? 
I think if we could look at those moments as learning moments for ourselves and trying to examine within ourselves what do we think could, we could have done better is also really important. So there's some pitfalls that I think we fall into as clinicians and on one of them is on either extreme is over blaming ourselves for something and the other extreme is blaming somebody else. Um, and again, I'm very compassionate about this because I think it's a human thing to do. This is a very difficult moment for us when we're facing our, our own fallibility or facing having been involved in someone's care and instead of making them better, actually making them worse. So I think it's very natural to either want to blame oneself excessively so that, again, unconsciously we're asking for forgiveness for the, from the patient and family, but I think it's important to not ask for forgiveness, as I said, except that if you're given it, it's really important not to blame ourselves until we know for sure that we are to blame. And that may be absolutely the case as we figure out more about what happened. But in the moment, a lot of times we rush to think, oh my gosh, I, sh I did a bad job, it's my fault, I accept this blame. And it feels very professional to do that, but it can actually really be harmful, as I was saying before, where we don't want to speculate. And the other extreme, again, quite natural, is to, in the especially the immediate aftermath, is to assign blame to where you think it, it, it is. And that is a problem because for a couple reasons. One is I think we all recognize that even if we know exactly who was at the sharp end of the error, we have to recognize that we as a system put that person in a position where he or she could make an error and that error would reach the patient. And so I think that we are all responsible to some degree for what goes wrong. And I th the more we look at errors as partly due to systems, and feel that we should both be personally accountable for what happens, but also the system should be accountable as well, the less appropriate it is to just turn around and p point the finger at one person, even if he or she was, as I say, at the sharp end of the error. Another very common mistake is to be unclear about what happened, to not describe it succinctly, to use jargon, and again, totally understandable, we really don't want them to know what happened in some ways unconsciously, but I think we have to really think about overcoming that natural human urge to obfuscate. Another mistake I think is to omit the word, I'm sorry. Whether it's empathic or apologetic, it's very easy to shy away from that word because we feel like we're incriminating ourselves and I think we have to let go of worrying about incrimination and just let that natural human empathy come out. I don't know a clinician who is not empathic to a patient who's suffering or has suffered especially at our hands. I'm so sorry this happened. I think that's something everybody's capable of saying but we forget because we don't forget. I think we avoid it because we're afraid. I think that having support for preparing for a disclosure conversation is incredibly important and we're using a coaching model for that because none of us is an expert in this. From our own clinical experience, none of us has had enough experience doing these disclosure conversations, thank goodness, because we haven't had enough errors to become expert. So we have people who are experts in doing this to coach in the moment prep for a meeting with a family if there's time and I think that 
that's part of the commitment that we have as an institution. And the other is to have a peer support program where those emotions and the, the, the fallout from being involved in a medical error can be processed and there's a place where with a peer you can talk about how that feels because what we do recognize and from the studies we've done is that it's a very hard for somebody who is not in medicine to know how bad this feels and if we want which we do our colleagues and each other to grow from this experience and not become burnt out or depressed then we really need to be explicit in supporting each other after things go wrong. And I think that'll have a twofold effect. One is improving our ability to be present in a compassionate way with our patients and families. And also, it'll improve our ability to report near misses and errors to our leaders so that we can actually look at them without judgment, with accountability, but with also the eye to improving our patient safety and quality in the future. A lot of these pitfalls can be mitigated by actually practicing the disclosure prior to doing it, and I think that's where coaching comes in. Sometimes what's in our heads about what we think we're going to say is not the same as what comes out when we're sitting in the moment because of all those emotions. Without claiming that we know the perfect way to do this, I think this teaching module is a way of pointing out some of the important touchstones to think of before having this conversation and understanding that it's really important to get help from colleagues or people who have expertise in having these conversations so that when we do show up, it's in a way that really, really is what the patient and family need. So to summarize the salient points, I think the first thing to remember is what is the goal? And the goal is having a discussion that is both compassionate and transparent regarding what happened to the patient. To that end, recognizing that we have emotions that, would, that may make us vulnerable to be not expressing that compassion in a way that pa the patients can feel. So identifying our own emotions and then not walking in with those emotions. Being very explicit about being empathic, both in our language and in our posture and our behavior. Be being very clear about the facts that we know and stating those facts in a clear way that does not involve medical jargon allowing for the patient to express his or her emotions and the family as well, that is allowing for silence and welcoming questions. Being careful again not to blame or over blame ourselves or others. Expressing empathy by saying you're sorry that something happened. Apologizing if in fact you're at the point where you know in fact there's something to apologize for and apologizing clearly. and making sure that the patient knows that this is a process, that you're available for further questions, that you're going to, as an institution, try to learn from this and that you'll get back to them. First of all, if they, do, if they have any questions that come up and also if you have any more information as things evolve and you understand more about what happened and then actually making sure that that promise is followed up on. All of that all of those recommendations, I believe, are predicated upon our commitment as a community and an institution to be able to help each other when we either figuratively or literally walk out of the patient's room so that those emotions that we ask you to put on hold, like feeling guilty or ashamed, we can help with and we can help you and each other forgive ourselves for being human not to say we shouldn't be accountable because we should. It's our obligation to learn everything we can from our mistakes and our near misses. And it's also our obligation to support each other in that 
and it's our obligation to look at the system to make sure that our colleagues don't make the same error tomorrow or next year.